Hey, Al Scott Horton here. Are you a libertarian and or peacenik? Live in North America? If you want, you can hire me to come and give a speech to your group. I'm good on the terror war and intervention, civil liberty stuff, blaming Woodrow Wilson for everything bad in the world, Iran, central banking, political realignment, and, well, you know, everything. I can teach markets to liberals and peace to the right. Just watch me. Check out scotthorton.org slash speeches for some examples and email me, scott at scotthorton.org, for more information. See you there. Oi vey. And I'm sitting here arguing with Justin Romano on Twitter about Rand Paul. What's to argue? He's the worst person on earth. Okay? He's horrible on everything. <sighs> well, luckily, uh, Sheldon Richmond's on Skype, so I didn't have to stop and call him and give you guys dead air. Hi, Sheldon. How are you? I'm fine, Scott. How are you? I'm doing great. I appreciate you joining us. Everybody, Sheldon Richmond, he's about as libertarian as a man can be. He's over at SheldonRichmond.com, and he's good on everything. I don't ever have to argue with him about Rand Paul. Um, <laughs> anyway, so listen, you wrote this great thing um, about how our government is the cause of any terrorist threat, however overblown, as you stipulate, uh, that the American people face, and how the more they fix things, the more hundreds of thousands of people die all across the Middle East, uh, how they've, uh, in a word, ruined the 21st century so far, the government of the USA has and uh, and you say in there, you know, maybe if we didn't have them, we wouldn't need them. Since, of course, their <laughs> excuse for us needing them is uh, protecting us from all the enemies that they create for us. Touche. But then, and this comes up from time to time, as you know. Oh, yeah? Well, what's the alternative to having a government? Because ever since Westphalia, everybody knows that you got to have 190-something nation states in the world uh, with their guns drawn at each other's heads all the time. And including thermo nukes, I guess, and whatever. And um, and by the way, you know, my neighbor, a few houses down, he kidnapped some little girls just the other day. So obviously, we need cops to prevent things like that. And it wasn't the government that made him a criminal. He's just a criminal. Uh, and they let him go, by the way. The cops did. But anyway, that doesn't undermine my wonderful statist argument. We need government because bad countries and bad politicians in other countries and bad people who live in our neighborhoods, Sheldon. And so how could you possibly be an anarchist in the face of this real world that we live in, sir? <laughs> uh, yeah, the line about if we didn't have uh, an old line, it, I first heard it in terms of lawyers. Right? They said if we, if we didn't have lawyers, we wouldn't need them. Uh, so I figured I thought I'd hijack it and put it to political use. Um, anyway, uh, the state has gotten us into all kinds of messes and for, for intrinsic reasons, uh, uh, politicians, people who run governments, no matter what the form of government, uh, it may be, uh, are always going to be essentially unaccountable. So the people that run governments essentially can, pretty much do what they want. There's there's only minor accountability. There's, the consequences are not very great. Most people aren't paying attention. They're too busy with their lives. They don't, especially when it comes to foreign affairs, they don't, they don't know the history. They don't, you know, they don't know the esoteric uh, information that would uh, uh, enable them to make better judgments. A lot of stuff is simply done in secrecy, as we know, and you don't find out until years later. So, uh, you know, the, the governments are, governments have the potential to be rogue, especially if they're the governments of a quote, great power, like the United States or, you know, any, any others you can name, uh, Russia or, or Iran, even, you know, Iran, all of them. Uh, they, they just can't be trusted. Now, your question is, uh, you, you're quite, you're quite, your point might be, well, okay, I can grant that, but, but how could we be the only ones who give, give up the state when everyone else has one? And, um, and, and there, I would say, uh, uh, at least if we gave up the state, the, the, you know, we wouldn't have the U.S. government doing what it's been doing, at least since World War II. And we probably can go back before that uh, in the Middle East, where it's been making enemies and thereby endangering the Americans. So the, the, not only endangering and killing foreigners, but uh, I, I talked about endangering Americans because, as I say in the beginning of the article, the politicians tell us that their first duty is to protect the American people. OK, let's take them on the on their own terms. If that's true, why are they constantly embroiling the American people in these sectarian and tribal and political and ethnic and other kinds of disputes that come back uh, to haunt us uh, through blow, blow back and what you call backdraft and other, and other uh, things so that we, we can't uh, tolerate this anymore. The government is a, is a troublemaker. It gets us into trouble. It doesn't protect us. 
Could we do better without it? Well, you know, I can't give you a blueprint for how a stateless society would look because that would that that's the very point. It's spontaneous order. It's bottom up, just like you couldn't tell me what the uh, what a free market in computers would look like before it happens. I can't tell you what shape exactly uh, private uh, uh, protection would take. But it's it's going to be better than the state because the state is out is serves the ruling class, serves privileged interests, and they don't give a damn about the rest of us, which is why they don't mind you know imperiling us. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, no doubt about that. I can't think of an enemy that <laughs> wasn't created by the American establishment one way or the other. Um, even going back to Hitler, I mean, for crying out loud, even the Nazis were bankrolled by the American power elite, those who own the state, the bankers uh, most closely tied to the state, even going back that far. Uh, Lend lease to Joe Stalin uh, to help him turn back the Nazi tide. Then we turn around and make him the, the biggest enemy in the world to justify the whole Cold War and and on and on like that. But um, so but, you know, come on, if we didn't have a monopoly on power in D.C. to prevent another one from replacing it, it would be replaced by another one of people, maybe even worse. At least we get to vote for these guys, Sheldon. <laughs> get the caster one vote. Makes a big difference. Uh, well, a couple things about that. Um, uh, for one thing, if you have a state, uh, especially a national state, rather than say uh, highly decentralized, although I wouldn't want a lot of little st- uh, states either, but that would be preferable to a highly decentralized one. There's a, you know, if somebody were outside wanted to take over what were, it'd be, it'd be different since it wouldn't be this single landmass under, under one jurisdiction. But if somebody wanted to take that over, they'd have to actually conquer it like household by household. There'd be nothing to surrender, right? You know, the British, the British took, uh, didn't take very long to conquer India because it had a very, uh, well developed, uh, political structure and class. In- you know, put some, uh, buy off some people, put them in charge, and voila, they, they could rule India for a long time. Uh, it took, um, it took them much longer to conquer Ireland, which was, uh, fairly anarchistic. And, uh, you know, you had to basically conquer it, you know, one, uh, clan at a time. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a heck of a lot, uh, more difficult. And, uh, you know, just because one, uh, little group may surrender, uh, that doesn't mean the next one, you know, next door is surrendering and they may continue to resist. So I think there's a, you know, a, a, that sort of decentralized defense can be, uh, you know, much more uh, effective. And you have to wonder who, you know, who today is going to uh, try to invade uh, what we call the United States and take it over anyway. The Russians, the Iranians, uh, you know, say what you want about them. I don't think that's on their mind uh, or that they believe they'd be even capable of doing that. Right. In fact, just yesterday, Yossi Melman, uh, the Israeli intelligence analyst, Wrote a story for the Wash or for the Jerusalem Post saying there is no existential threat to Israel, uh, much less the United States of America. Uh, if anybody wants to look at a map of just the size, and of course there's the great, um, I think it's it's true, it's apocryphal anyway. The uh, the Japanese general who said invade America, not in a million years. Are you kidding me? There would have been a rifle behind every blade of grass, and he wasn't talking about the army. He was talking about the Californians. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, but now, so what about the creeps in my neighborhood? Um, there are creeps in my neighborhood, and just because the cops let this guy get away with kidnapping two little girls the other day, uh, I don't know. I guess it's a self-refuting point. I'm an anarchist too, Sheldon. I'm not doing a very good job of playing devil's advocate here, but give me a minute. we got to take this stupid break, and then we'll be back with the great Sheldon Richmond. He's going to talk about free market security in our land, in our time, right after this. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the social network and community-based publishing platform for the liberty-minded. Liberty.me combines the best of social media technology all in one place and features classes, discussions, guides, events, publishing, podcasts, and so much more. And Jeffrey Tucker and I are starting a new monthly show at Liberty.me, Eye on the Empire. It's just 4 bucks a month if you use promo code SCOTT when you sign up. And hey, once you do, add me as a friend on there at scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty dot me. No, seriously, the guy three houses down from me kidnapped two little girls the other night. And then he kept them for like two hours. Apparently he didn't touch them or kill them. He brought them back to a street full of flashing red and blue lights, if you believe that. But then they let him go. 
The fact that he was white and the little girls that he abducted were black, oh, that probably has nothing to do with it, right? Can't imagine if it had been the other way around. But anyway, let's pretend for a minute that uh, he was black and the little girls that he abducted were white. Then he would have gone to prison and then I would have had an argument to make to Sheldon Richmond right here. Like, hey, Sheldon, who's going to arrest and prosecute the kidnappers? If we don't have a, a monopoly county police or city police jurisdiction, if, if we don't have judges who have the right to preclude other judges from deciding and they get to decide and and uh, and put people like that in cages where they belong. Well, this anecdote you tell uh, leads me to think, and I didn't know this, that you lived in a little anarchist community. I didn't know that. So you're making a complaint about anarchism because some guy got away with kidnapping some girls. I guess uh, so. <laughs> um, so I don't understand when people raise an objection to anarchism by pointing to an example that occurred, well, in a, in a context where there are states all over the place. I don't quite get the logic of that. Right. I know you did. You didn't mean it that way, but that's all that often happens. Uh, well, you know, there is some uh, there is some past um, uh, examples we can look at uh, that have been written about by John Hasness, great libertarian legal scholar and uh, and Bruce Benson, another uh, libertarian legal scholar about uh, there have been the sort of pockets of history where uh, there was no centralized state. And yet criminal justice was uh, was carried out. Uh, in fact, it was more carried out in terms of. Uh, 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 reimbursing or making restitution to the victim rather than sending money to the king, which is what happens today, right? The fine goes to the state and the person may get imprisoned, but the victim uh, ch usually gets nothing. That's an afterthought. The victim may be able to sue in civil court, but th the burden is there, there then on the victim. Uh, so crime wasn't really crime. It was, it was tort and it was seen as not a, not a breaking of the king's peace or the, of a society's peace, but of wronging a particular person. And so the whole uh, the thrust of the system was to how to make that person whole as much as possible. And in the case of murder, where of course the victim is gone, uh, the, the heirs or the family of, um, of the victim, well, they would, there would be some form of restitution to that person. And the, just like today, we have wrongful death uh, awards, although that's hand, again handled in civil court, separate from the criminal court. Uh, so the point is people do figure out a way to do this. We, we seem, you know, the basic premise here that I'm challenging is that, uh, and we, and it's funny because libertarians don't accept this in, 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 in other cases, that somehow if it weren't for the politicians in the state, we'd all just be sitting around, you know, uh, twiddling our thumbs saying, gosh, I don't, we don't know what the heck to do. We're just going to sit here until, you know, somebody does something for us. That's not what happens. People get up and form mutual aid societies and and uh, and uh, insurance companies and uh, organizations that vouch for individuals, so you know who you're dealing with and you know that if if this uh, person A that you're dealing with wrongs you, you there are procedures for you file to file a grievance and a complaint against that person, and, which then gets heard. I mean, uh, libertarians ought to be reading about the Law Merchant, which was the uh, completely uh, private commercial law that was generated in the after the fall of the Roman Empire by international traders who didn't want to go into inter to, to national courts because because if you were a foreigner you didn't trust them so merchants set up basically their own courts and their own body of law which we still actually have today it is, uh, eventually became uh, you know commercial law but uh, it worked very well lots of scholars have studied this pete leeson and george mason and uh, you know other economists have studied this political scientists have studied it and people are able to carry out those so-called legitimate functions of the state without a monopoly state. It, 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 it's in there in the history. Yeah, I guess um, we're just not supposed to pay attention to that. I saw somebody tweeted earlier today. I'm paging down to find the quote. It was a quote from Rothbard along the lines of uh, how a hard. Oh, here it is. States always needed intellectuals to con the public into believing that its rule is wise, good and inevitable. That really is kind of the bottom line, huh? It's all just one big PR campaign. Right. And, and the, of course, the story that everybody learns from uh, from school, of course, the government controls the schools, uh, no, no coincidence there, is that the reason we have government was because there was this crying need that wasn't being served uh, by the people, by the general, you know, the people in general. But if, in fact, if you go back and look at the history of states, uh, the states are the result of conquest. And uh, and by by rulers who who decide rather than you know rob the people and move on to the next group, it makes much more sense to rob the people, 
stay where you are and continually rob them and protect them from rival robbers. And they'll, then they become grateful to you because you're protecting them. Meanwhile, you're robbing them every day to finance all this and, you know, doing other stuff like granting monopolies and other kinds of privileges to benefit the, uh, you know, your friends, your, the ruling class. That's how states arise. It wasn't that people sat around saying, oh, what are we going to do? We, you know, we can't, we can't protect ourselves. Let's form a state. Okay. It wasn't, and it wasn't Thomas Hobbes' story either. So it wasn't a social contract that never, you know, that never happened. It was the result of conquest. Yeah, and that's that, that great article, Anatomy of the State, was going out earlier. I was arguing with a so-called libertarian and conservative about the cops, and, and he was saying, well, they're, you know, they're just here to protect us and this and that, but uh, really where they come from is they're the slave catchers. Man, they're the guys who, uh, they're the enforcers of, and I, I sent him that one where, where Rothbard says that the state itself, it's just organized criminality writ large. They really are nothing but a gang. And, you know, it's funny because whenever I say I'll be talking about anti-government stuff, about the worst stuff, the wars, police states, uh, innocent uh, people laying in uh, their corpses, uh, laying in puddles of blood on the side of the road for no reason. And people say to me, oh, you just hate every little old lady that works down at the Social Security office. You deny that any <laughs> person who works for government could possibly be a good person anyway. Jesus, I'm in the middle of an argument with Just Ramondo on Twitter right now as we speak about this. Oh, anyone that you disagree with about anything is a bad person. No, just Rand Paul is. Doesn't mean every, one of, every member of his staff that I condemn them, but the Senate itself, yeah. And and he's the perfect example when the son of Ron Paul can't help but be uh, absolutely horrible in the United States Senate. That's time to call the whole project off, if you ask me. Well, because the incentives, uh, that's the way the incentives work. Uh, you know, I've said many times uh, Ron could say the kinds of things he said without uh, inhibition because he knew he wasn't going to win the nomination or uh, and therefore he was never going to be president. But Rand Paul, actually, I assume, I don't know him, apparently thinks he can. And therefore, he can't blow the opportunity he thinks he has by alienating uh, a lot of other people. So he's got to give this muddied message that, that he's been giving, which is not even becoming, uh, you know, not even muddy anymore. Now it's sort of just pure intervention. Uh, you know, he signed the cotton letter. He, uh, he voted for uh, uh, higher uh, military spending. Uh, so it's not even a mixed message anymore. It's a, it's like a pure uh, pro empire message, right. uh, because precisely because he thinks he can win, and the incentives are you got to gather constituencies. So you got to you got you can't say things that are going to uh, make people mad. And uh, you know, Ron Paul didn't mind making people mad. Right? Yeah, he was happy to. I mean, if it came to it, right? It was it wasn't his point, but uh, if you were, and and you know. And, and well, whatever. We all remember 08 and 12, especially. He he told people what they didn't want to hear all the damn time on the right and the left and everything else. Uh, and let the heavens fall. But now, so I don't know why these 10 minute segments just seem to go by in five or six to me now, Sheldon. But can we spend the rest of the time uh, talking about some good reading material? Uh, what would you have people look at if they really want to understand anarcho capitalism or, you know, whatever it is you want to call it? Yeah, I don't call it anarcho-capitalism. That's a whole other talk about why I don't like the word capitalism. I think there's good reasons to avoid that word. I, I like the free market, not capitalism. Uh, I would think a very good place to start. It's very accessible. It's not a very long book. And it is, it is like written for the lay reader is Gary Chartier's uh, The Conscience of an Anarchist. So you can find that uh, through Amazon or other places. Uh, definitely worth uh, looking at. Uh, Rothbard's material is is good. I mean, I wouldn't uh, uh, make that all you read because there, there's been much more that has been written about uh, on this subject since uh, you know since Rothbard wrote. But I would look at uh, uh, Bruce Benson's The Enterprise of Law, which I've uh, already mentioned. He he also will discuss the in that book discusses the uh, the law merchant and other other anarchistic episodes in um, in history. Uh, John Hasness has some very good papers on uh, online. Uh, one I would look up is, and he's a he's a law professor. I, I would look up his uh, paper uh, toward a theory of empirical natural rights. Uh, Google that and you'll find it. That's definitely worth reading. You can find work, great work by Roderick Long online, where he's answering objections to uh, anarchism. Just put in Roderick Long objection to anarchism. I, I think it's like ten different objections. Uh, and that will lead you to other things. All these things have uh, have um, references, and you can follow the trail and, and read a whole lot about it. There's a huge and growing 
uh, uh, literature on this subject. All right. That's Sheldon Richmond at SheldonRichmond.com. Thanks so much for your time again, Sheldon. Great to talk to you. My pleasure, Scott. See you. All right. We'll be right back, y'all. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at ScottHorton.org or TheWarState.com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Hornberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrensCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world, all specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. DarrensCoffee.com. Use promo code Scott and you get free shipping. DarrensCoffee.com. 